you have to, in your life, get people to want to work with you and want to help you. This is Adam Bryant with the New York Times. Each week, for the Corner Office feature in Sunday Business, I sit down with the chief executive to talk about leadership and management. For the anniversary of the financial crisis, I asked Lloyd Blankfein, chairman and CEO of Goldman Sachs, to discuss how he managed through the upheaval, which Goldman survived in much better shape than other firms on the street. We also talked about some key lessons he learned that shaped his leadership style. Lloyd, tell me about how your leadership and management style evolved, changed over the last couple of years during this financial crisis. I think I had a lot of the principles in place, but clearly over the last period, communication, teamwork, um, and driving and promoting the sense of partnership in our firm was a very, very big deal. And, and so how did that manifest itself? What did you find yourself doing more of or less of in this last couple of years versus the period before, just sort of day-to-day -day management? What I did more of, and then I kept doing more and more of it as it got, as I sort of got validated as a strategy, is that I talked to the firm very frequently. So mm -hmm. in the last year and a half, and particularly in p periods of peak stress, I would literally send a voicemail a day to the whole firm. I'd walk around the firm. I'd answer people's questions. I'd get emails and respond to them. And generally, this firm has a walk-around culture. Um, it's a very flat organization. Um, people expect to see you and talk to you, but I really emphasize that. Are there any lessons that you drew from the experience that if anything like this were to happen again, you would be saying to yourself, okay, I'm prepared for that. I've got to remember to do the following few things. I learned about the importance of making sure that everyone in the organization interprets his job or her job expansively, that everybody's looking at, the, at, at his or her neighbor. And because what you want to get is a lot of opinions. People can get trapped by their context. In fact, the nature of a bubble is that the people, almost definitionally, who are in it can't see it or else it would never have occurred. But other people can exercise critical faculty based upon their different context or their perspective, asking people opinions, getting a lot of information, establishing a culture where people think it's not only extra credit, but it's their duty to give you opinions about things that they think that they're worried about or, or, or isn't right, and we, uh, and we encourage that very much. In terms of hiring people, given what you've led through and managed through in the last couple of years, has it changed, even in a small way, the kind of people you're looking for, the qualities they bring to the table? We want people to be teamwork. We want people to communicate. We want people to respond to the overall needs of the firm. We have to make decisions all the time on, in order to resolve conflicts. We might be representing, there might be a cable property for sale. And we might have, as our client, four of the six most likely buyers. Who will we represent? We'll have to get together and make a decision based on a number of factors. Mm -hmm. But you can't have the people who represent the three disappointed people who've invested in their relationships go on a hunger strike or jump off a cliff just because they lost. They have to understand what our strategy and why it made sense. So there's a, we need people who can absorb that and be behave as a team and think of the, of the firm's total good. And that, that, by the way, that screens out a lot of people. What do you feel, looking back, were the most important leadership lessons you learned? And where did you learn them? I remember the first time I was put in charge. Uh, I, I was running a small desk in foreign exchange sales. And I was put in charge of the foreign exchange business included sales and trading, the risk part of the business. And of course, you know, the way bread always lands on the buttered side down, like the first minute I'm in the business, the business is going through something where we start losing, uh, we start losing money. And by the standards at even that time, it was probably a piddling amount of money, but it meant a lot to me. And I was nervous as hell, and I went into my boss uh, at the time, and I said, um, and I tried to be cool, because that's the way you, you speak. Um, and I said, you know, we're losing money. And he, you know, he could tell. And he said, well, first thing he did was he said, what would you do? A very smart thing of him to do. And I, I said what I would do. And he said, that sounds right. Why don't you do that? Which was great, because I, will have I, would, I would have remembered that always and have. As I thought of what to do, he just validated it. But his validation made it my idea if it worked and his problem if it didn't. So he took a lot of pressure off me. He took weight off the scale for me. 
And I remember a second lesson in that same meeting because I pivoted, I turned to walk out the room, and he said, Lloyd, just one second before you go, why don't you stop in the men's room first, throw some water at your, on your face, because if people see you looking as green as you look, they'll jump out the window. <laughs> and that was kind of a second thing, was I learned in general about how important that kind of symbolism is and how, con and how you can inspire or defeat confidence. Before you even worked at Goldman, do you, looking back over your life, recall some really formative experiences that kind of laid the foundation for your leadership style? I mean, even when you were a teenager, extracurricular activities or in college or something. My first job when I got my working papers at 13 was I got a job as a vendor at Yankee Stadium, old Yankee Stadium with very steep stairs in the upper decks. And I was selling something that was all commission based. And I think uh, like a soft drink was 25 cents and I think you got a 10 or 11 percent commission. And I remember walking along and somebody in the upper part of the upper desk would raise a hand and say, I'd like a soda. And I'm thinking, this tray is unbelievably heavy and the lids didn't work so well in the 1960s as they would today. And I'm going to walk all the way up there for three, you know, for two and three quarter cents. And guess what? I walked all the way up there for two and three quarter cents. And in terms of working with others, leading others, I mean, that great story about Yankee Stadium was about sort of you and, and your character. But in terms of working with others? Life is always about contracts that you make with people. Very few of them are written. Most of them are implicit. And most of them evolve out of a course and of dealing and understanding. And if you are good for your people, they'll be good to you and help you and help propel you up in your career. And what's your version of a two-minute commencement speech? Let's say it's a graduating class of business school students. Don't be totally obsessed by about getting everything right. In my own experience, I plotted and planned my life when I, life when I was getting out of law school to know by what year I'd make it to the Supreme Court. That didn't work out the way I'd planned. You don't know what the environment is. Hell, you don't even know yourself. So I would take some of the pressure off and think about what I wanted to do, what I liked, to, what I wanted to be for the next two or five years and suspend your faculty beyond that because by then it might be totally different anyway. The world will have changed and you might have changed. And that will lead you to the corollary, which is you should do what you want to do.